start and see who's coming. Uh, hello. I can see you guys are super exhausted already. It's almost two weeks. Tomorrow it's going to be two weeks. But uh, as I briefly said to, to some people, that this, this will be worthwhile to, <laughs> uh, to, to, to actively engage uh, to this program. Uh, maybe at this moment you're tired, but maybe a month or two months after, you'll miss it a lot. You'll even miss me. Right? I'm not sure about that. Um, so, as announced, uh, today we have a special guest uh, today, tonight, Jung Yoon Kim, Kim Jong Yoon. Uh, she's uh, going to uh, give a public lecture tonight, and she's the principal of the landscape architecture firm of, uh, called Office Park Kim. So, she's Kim and her partner, uh, Park. So it's parking. <laughs> it's very Korean. Very, very Korean, parking. Korean, Korean name. It's named a while ago, so the guy's surname came first. But well, yeah. Right. But or or it's a landscape firm, so maybe the park always has to come first. It sounds better. It sounds better. Than King, King Park. 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 Right. That's true. And Park also, King. I was worried that you know the law firm. Ah, I know. <laughs> so, 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 I, 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 I love their work. I mean, uh, I mean, we, we can get into this conversation, but there, there are different types of landscape architecture form, but uh, you, you have to check their, 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 their works. Uh, uh, they also recently published uh, a book called Alternative Nature. So, as you can imagine, the, the works are not just uh, about good or nice design, but it's also uh, very much uh, based on the theories that they are pursuing. And as you can ex uh, imagine uh, from their kind of uh, research or theory-based works, uh, Jung Yoon is now a professor at uh, Harvard University at GSD. Uh, she, she's been teaching there for a couple of years, but uh, from last year, uh, she's been, uh, uh, she, she was appointed as an assistant professor there. So uh, I, I believe that she will uh, have more continuous, let's say, research and, uh, uh, and, and how to say, researches uh, through the studios and with students and so on. Uh, but tonight, I, I, I think that she will, uh, she will share some of the works uh, that sh she had done with the previous students related to our, our topic. So please welcome Jung Yoon Kim, and uh, I hope uh, you enjoy tonight's lecture, and uh, I believe that you, you will also ask a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. But anyways, for now, let's uh, give a big applause. I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to 약간 멀리서 해도 들려서 네 그럼 여기다 아, 아 그래서 약간 넣으셨구나 아아아네 아. 여기에 좀 넣고 아 이렇게 아 하이 it's my great pleasure to be here I'm Jung Yoon um, thank you for uh, inviting me for this such a great uh, venue it's too bad that the Biennale cannot happen this year but I'm glad that this event can continue no matter what and um, I uh, Every time that I have to have a lecture um, for a specific theme, there, there has been quite a good opportunity for me to reorganize my work. You know, then uh, that I never, because you know, we're, I'm not, 
I'm not like PhD academian or I'm not ecologist or anything. So I'm, I'm, I'm designer. So especially in Korea, we cannot really survive if I'm specialized in one thing. So for example, in America, there are architects who are specialized in hospital, but here it's not possible. So, uh, but then during the research, we can have a theme or a topic for some years that we can we want to pursue. And then sometimes we have opportunity to um, apply that topic or research theme to practice as well. So for us, um, research has not been really separate from uh, practice for a while. And I'm glad that I can have this time uh, to talk about my research and project in terms of border and also how we see border as a kind of possibility um, as a territory uh, to be extended to territories so that it can function as framework to accommodate any future um, settlement or physical um, um, changes in city and other settings. So uh, Dongwu um, initially offered me a translation service but I, I, I think it's quite awkward that because I, I'm not a native uh, English speaker, but then if someone whose English is much better than me <laughs> sitting next to me and then translate my um, bad English to Korean, it's really strange. So I'm going to uh, briefly um, summarize what I said in English in Korean every slide uh, so that we, can, we don't have to like, stay forever here. But I, I also uh, like to say this, that I usually hate uh, giving and be sitting in front of long lecture, longer than one hour. So I'm going to be really trying to be uh, brief. So uh, today, I'm going to write a few words in Korean. But I don't know if any of the people speak English, so if you don't understand English, please ask me to ask you a few words. I'm going to give you a few words in Korean. So um, why, uh, why border, why DMZ? I was thinking that because Yunjin and I, both of, both of us are not really political people. We are not really, you know, we're not really that interested in uh, like North and South issue and that kind of thing. But then somehow we, uh, we ended up with doing this studio about DMZ and Harvard GSD. And I think there was two reasons that why we are um, kind of interested in doing this border issue and then uh, the potential of border to be extended to territory. I think first of all, um, it was from initiated from our interest in uh, wilderness. The wilderness as a kind of counterpart of uh, urbanism that has not been disturbed by human activity. Because you know we, we have been talking about this alternative nature thing, but then to be able to create anything alternative to real nature in urban setting, we have to know what is the kind of prototype of nature that uh, were existing before that we don't have it anymore. So I think the, the, the kind of our interests in DMZ started from there, uh, which is our interest in wilderness. And then second, secondly, what I want to uh, say is, you know, this is the main page of our website. I told you that the border has been thought of as a border. 그 wilderness, 그 황야, 중국 사람들은 황야라고 쓰는데요. 황야에 대한 관심에서 시작된 것 같아요. 그래서 DMZ가 사실은 뭐 천혜의 자연은 당연히 아니죠. 되게 오염되어 있는 땅인데 결국은 50년 넘게 방치돼 있었기 때문에 wilderness라고 저희는 봤거든요. 그래서 그 wilderness에 대한 그 어, 관심에서 그러니까 약간 자연, 그러니까 도시와의 카운터파트가 되는 좀 바이너리 thinking일 수도 있는데 어, 그거로서의 wilderness로서의 DMZ에 처음에 관심을 갖게 됐던 것 같아요. So this is the main page of Park Kim. And uh, when we arrived back in Seoul from Netherlands, uh, we, we were not really a part of the system here. So we didn't, we didn't, really, uh, we didn't really know how to become a part of the system. So we kind of have to choose, either we try really hard to be part of them or just be ourselves. So in English, 
we this we have this expression called oddball, but I'm not sure how how I can say this in Korean. So we were kind of landing in our country, but somehow it was not something that we were accustomed to, but it was already kind of terrorized by others so that we, we didn't know how to adapt ourselves. So we kind of tried to uh, find our own way. Then naturally, uh, what we were looking at was the borders between those. So borders between disciplines, which is architecture and landscape architecture. And sometimes it was borders between the ground and underground. And sometimes it was border between the water and mountain that, some, that not many people already dealt with so that we can actually territorize those fields that for, for ourselves. So I think that was how we kind of wanted to look at more like edge condition and borders that was not really specified by others uh, too much yet. 그래서 우리가 서울에 와서 처음에 그런 이제 보더들에 관심을 갖게 된게 단순히 이런 뭐 DMZ나 그런 보더뿐만 아니라 항상 그런 경계나 엣지 부분에 관심이 많았어요. 건축과 조경의 관, 뭐 경계라든지 저희 사실 뭐 그런 분야를 나누고는 별로 안 좋아했었는데. 그러다 보니까 어, 남들이 생각하지 않는 것들을 많이 보게 된것 같아요 처음에 너무 늘어지지 않나요 이렇게 하는 거 괜찮으세요? 오케이 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 so I'm gonna talk about borders in practice and research so first of all uh, let me just brief, briefly explain how we have been focusing on this uh, border and edge issue in our practice and then and then I'm going to talk about two studio projects in uh, that I, Yunjin and I led in GSD about. One is about DMZ, and the other one is about Siberia. So I took the students to Siberia Trans Trans Siberia Railway for a week, and then we uh, research about Siberia as well. So first of all, we we had this term called Sansujolia, which is mountain and water strategy. So you know, we all know that Korea, 70% of Korean peninsula is mountainous, right? So we have just plenty of mountain and water. That means all the landscape architects who, who work in Korea have to deal with somehow all this water and mountain issue, which we lost a lot of them. But then, uh, so anyway, I th we feel like that uh, how to treat mountain and water is kind of key key issue for all the landscape architects in Korea. So we've been we've been calling it as a strategy, mountain and water strategy. So uh, this is Yanghua Waterfront, Yanghua Riverfront project. Have you, if you've been to Seonyudo, Yanghua is kind of in front of Seonyu, Seonyu Island. So here, uh, you know, before, after 1970s, Han River has been all this like, 저수부, 중수부, 고수부, water, low water, mid water, high water level, like three tier terrace system. By, with concrete. So we didn't really have this in-between spaces between those different different levels. So what we did was we kind of stretched the, the borders between those planes so that when, when the, uh, after each summer flood, uh, usually the mud stays on the terraces and then city of Seoul had to spend a lot of time and effort to clean the mud. But then after we made those stretched slopes from the borders between the plains, now it's so much easier to remove the mud. The mud just carried back to the river when the, the water level goes down. So for us, by looking at those edges of the terraces, we kind of uh, thought that the rivers can also actually function as a mud infrastructure on top of being uh, the ledger, ledger play, the venue. So this is Yanghua Riverfront. Uh, Yang 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 and another kind of border could be the borders between the disciplines like um, architecture and landscape. Very clear um, uh, border usually uh, already kind of occupy the kind of preconception of the professional. So, but then we didn't really see that boundary is too necessary. So uh, this is another competition that we did in uh, 2014, no actually 13, 13. 
about the Catholic Motors Memorial Competition that we were uh, one of the seven finalists. And I, th I, I heard that the place is built very beautifully by the winner, which is great to hear. Um, so for, for this, we only changed the, the top slab of the existing uh, underground parking lot so that it could also, it could function for uh, the ground level memorial park and at the same time as a kind of bolted uh, ceiling of the cathedral, cathedral and exhibition space for underground memorial program. So the only, we changed only red part of the existing structure. So uh, by treating that slab surface as a kind of territory, not as a thin border between architecture and landscape, I, th I believe we were able to uh, propose uh, something that others didn't really think about or didn't want to think about. So this was the kind of view from the, the Daesongdang, the, the cathedral of the, the underground, underground program area. And at the same time, that surface will uh, function as a kind of undulating surface for the memorial. This is another condition that we can we usually uh, uh, see from the everyday life. So because we have a lot of mountain, and then in the new city, whenever we have to develop the land, uh, construction company usually push the boundary just to the end so that they can secure as much flat area as possible for maximum uh, profit. What, what, what's resulted from that was usually very severely uh, en engineered this uh, retaining wall structure at the edge. So it's really ugly to look at. And then usually, sometimes it's kind of, it caused the landslide because of the very uh, severely uh, cut the slope. 아, 이게 이제 우리나라 택지 개발할 때 주로 이렇게 경계가 생기잖아요. 되게 플랫을 많이 확보해야 되니까 이제 보통 토목이 들어와서 옹벽을 치면 거긴 조경을 이제 꽃 신고 나무 신고 보통 그렇게 하죠. 근데 이제 그렇게 해서는 기본적인 문제 해결이 안 되고 저희가 할수 있었던 게 CJ 사옥인데 광교에 어 2층에 회장님 방에서 이게 옹벽 사면이 바로 보이는 거예요. 그래서 이제 거의 공사 시작하고 나서 저희가 설계가 들어갔어요. 그래서 여기에 이제 어, 어떻게 하면 좋을 것이냐. 근데 기존의 어프로치로서는 된, 이거 이 보더를 트리트할 수가 없으니까 저희도 이제 부위 보더를 넓혔죠. So we had to convince both city and CJ to uh, kind of make the stretch out this retaining wall into gentler slope. So that uh, so at the beginning, the city of Suwon and also CJ thought that they're losing their land. But I have to convince them in different way that you are actually gaining more land by stretching this border to agile territory so that this, this piece of the, the kind of property line can be used as a sitting and other park area. So it doesn't have any property border between the park and then CJ complex anymore. And then whenever it rains, it also became cascade because the water, water are kind of uh, flowing down to the drainage area. And also it, it reduced the risk of the landslide as well because now slopes are much more gentler. 그래서 요거 이제 지금 블레이드 다 석재 블레이드인데 저희가 라인으로 다 디자인, 라인으로 디자인해 가지고 어다 레이저 컷한 거예요. 그래서 이제 거기 다 집어넣었고요. 그러니까 슬롭이 이제 스컬프처 스컬프틱한 슬롭이 된 거죠. So we design all the all the thing in Rhino and then uh, give dimension. Actually, we modulize at the end, and then it was uh, it, there are kind of combination of like three or four different module. And then um, you know, usually border also means kind of gray area. The border, uh, no one really care borders as their own territory, and then that means uh, in many times borders are kind of abandoned. So for example, like DMZ as well, it's political border, but somehow it was abandoned for like very long years. So for me, during our practice, uh, like city drainage sometimes is also like border situation, very gray area. Landscape architects only design the pattern of the, the, the pedestrian path, but then the civil engineers design the, uh, design the um, drainage. But then all this mismatch uh, results this bad drainage of the city, especially the Gangbuk area, where 
a uh, very minor undulation of the terrain really make difficulty for the construction company to make the very flat surf level the surface for the pedestrian path. And then, you know, we cannot really ha uh, wear a high heel uh, for those uh, pedestrian walk. Otherwise, I mean, it's so uncomfortable to walk, right? So when we were renovating the Tegero Malijero path, path uh, pedestrian path, which is the the, um, the both ends of the Seoullo by MVRDB. Uh, we, we use this precast concrete that never have been used in, in Seoul before for public path, uh, which is uh, very thick, thicker than other paving, so that it's stable. And then you can actually walk very uh, comfortably. And then because th there's actually no gap, uh, interval between the paving, uh, you can wear high heels as well there. So for me, uh, uh, the woman in high heels almost like same as handicapped people in, in Seoul, the pedestrian path situation. And also same, same thing for the tourists with the luggages, the rolling luggages. It, it has been so uncomfortable for them. So sometimes for us, solving this gray issue is also a very critical design, design topic. Uh, no, uh, even though people maybe not realize that this path has been designed even, but then they, they will be uh, feeling very comfortable when they're walking. And this is free cast concrete. And then the, the reason why also modulizing to triangular pieces because then uh, we can still keep the pattern, the flow of pattern, but then they can easily adjust to the minor terrain changes uh, with the triangular pieces. So of course, in the city of Seoul, we never really accept anything new, right? So we had to pay, uh, spend our own money to get this uh, a test result and then finally approved and then now is all installed. Maybe you can walk around in front of the, the Leskay Hotel and everything. Um, so I think I'm gonna just move slowly into the research part. Um, so, uh, in the early years of our company, we ha we applied for a lot of competition, and then we didn't really uh, won a lot of them. So all this defeated competition work, we try not to be consumed. So we try to write about them, and then publish about them, and then uh, kind of stacking our design language with those uh, defeated competition work. So this Gangnam Alternative Nature research also was part of our um, um, those kind of research activity that we, uh, it, it is published in uh, Asian Alternative Book um, in Singapore in 2007. Um, and then from there, the term alternative nature was firstly coined by Yunjin and myself. 강남, 강남의 대체 자연이라는 건데요. 그러니까 강남이 사실은 60년대까지는 다 논밭이었잖아요. 근데 이 논밭이, 제가 이제 강남에서 나고 자랐는데, 그 테란노를 한, 8월달 휴가철 이럴 때 일요일날 새벽에 운전을 해보면 옛날에 그 마차가 다니던 이그그 그, 그 마차가 아니라 뭐지 음뭐그 수레 같은 거 농사하시던 분들이 어, 끌고 다니시면서 느꼈을 듯한 그런 이렇게 언줄레이링 힐이 그저 느껴져요 차가 없을 때 이제 운전을 하면 되게 멀리까지 이렇게 로운 뷰가 보이면서 강남대로 같은데 테란 누나 이제 저희 제가 그걸 보면서 옛날에 아 저거 되게 옛날에 저렇게 언줄레이션이 있었겠다. 이제 그러면서 그걸 제가 느껴봤던 것 같아요. 자라면서. 그래서 어떤 되게 아티피셜한 얼반 환경이지만 우리가 공원이 이렇게 없는데 강남 땅값이 비싸고 사람들이 잘 살아남는 이유가 아무래도 어떤 아티피셜리티를 통해서라도 우리가 자연의 경험을 얻고 있지 않나. 그래서 이제 리서치한 게 얼터나티브 네이처였어요. 강남 얼터나티브 네이처고 어, 어떻게 보면 약간 그 강남 스타일의 공원 버전, 조경 버전이라고 할까요? 하여튼 그런, 그런 리서치였던 것 같아요. So alternative nature means uh, generating, uh, recreating nature, uh, experience of nature through artifact in urban, urban setting. So that has been our kind of uh, agenda in our practice a long time. And then I, I've been luckily uh, chosen as a recipient of Dean's research grant this year in Harvard GSD, and then my next research topic will be making of Gangnam alternative nature. So in this uh, research, I define, I recognize alternative nature, but then for that next research, I'm gonna suggest how to deal with this uh, uh, climate change effect in urban area, like urban flood and uh, 
heat, heat island issues by cr creating these alternative natures. So that will be coming next year. So anyway, um, so uh, so very, very, very naturally, we were looking at what is nature and what is natural. So sometimes landscape architects usually try to create, try to mimic nature, right? Like Olmsted in, in, in America, what he did was not really about ecological system, but try to create the, uh, the look of nature in, in, in the center of New York, which also create the natural experience. So for us, we always try to think if this project is about natural system or the look of nature. It, does it create the experience of nature or is, does it just mimic nature? So we try to have our own position of, of nature in wilderness. And I think that naturally uh, brought us to this competition entry last year. We won a second prize about Tanchon, Seoul International District Waterfront Competition. So you know, the, the Dominique Perros, uh the design has been realized now right right next to this tension area. And then uh, it will be dig into as deep as minus 56 meter into the underground. But then, uh, you know, this area used to be kind of web of uh, the tension branch waters underground. So now, but then now this is most complicated underground area in Seoul. The many uh, subway stations are already there, like minus 60 meter already. And then this is this inter intermodal transit center that designed by Dominic Perro will be there as deep as minus 60, 56. That means we are already losing 100 ton of water every day because of the subway. But then how much water are we gonna the, 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 the groundwater we're gonna lose, no one really knows. So that means if we lose this much, this much water, that means we have to put more money to extract groundwater from the deep aquifer from bedrock, and then the deficit of water will be just getting more serious and serious. So this is another border problem, I think. So the water flow doesn't end at the property, the development border, right? But then water always flow, like Im Jinggang always f has been flow through DMZ. So same thing. So we have to actually uh, give more holistic thinking about um, how we treat this underground um, hydrology, urban hydrology. So um, this is just short video. Um, oh, I don't know why always video doesn't work. 그래서 저는 이제 요즘 관심 있는 게 언더그라운드 그 수리 하이드로로지 관심이 많아요. 그래서 작년에 이거 이제 저희가 심사 때 만든 건데 어, 비가 이렇게 계속 오, 왜냐면 지금 또 진행 중인 게 뭐냐면 여기 그 지하 개발을 해서 그 물이 계속 없어질 거기 때문에 서울시에서 대책은 뭐냐면 여기에 이제 함양정이라는 걸 뚫어요. 그래서 함양정에다가 수돗물을 붓는 계획을 지금 세우고 있어요. 그래서 항상 이제 그 에코퍼 밑에 이제 그 대수층에 물을 계속 이제 그 담보하겠다는 거예요. 그러니까 계속 어떤 이런 되게 그 인위적인 어, 마금 장치 이제 그것들만 계속되고 있는 거죠. 계속 지하 개발은 되고 물은 계속 없어지는데 플라미 체인지 더 심해지고 있고 그래서 우리나라 물 부족이 아마 앞으로 더 심해질 거예요. 그래서 이제 지금 움직이지 않고 있는데 이 비디오가 뭐냐면 비가 이제 오고 또 이제 그 climate change one of the one of the result of climate change is the the water pollution because uh, because all this torrential uh, the rainfall uh, is out make all this uh, drainage pipeline out of capacity for a very short period so all the all this uh, um, the um, the rainwater runoff just flow directly into the river that without being filtered. So the river pollution has been really serious problem in Tanchan area. And also I think it's getting more serious in for, for Han River as well. So my our proposal was to to filter those runoff before going into Tanchan and also same and also also at the same time how to reserve those water to actually uh, uh, keep the, the underground, mo the, the aquifer as moist as possible, even though there are a lot of underground developments going on. So now I'm gonna let move move to uh, the GST research uh, topic. So I, I I told you about the our our uh, interest in wilderness as a kind of counterpart to the um, 
the urbanism. Um, I know this binary thinking between city and nature has been very obsolete, but we always found this binary thinking also as a kind of possibility. So without thinking about borders, we cannot really think about uh, territories, right? So thinking about wilderness always uh, give us chance to think about, uh, to, uh, to ponder what was the kind of intact function of nature in wilderness, and then what, what is the kind of natural status that we want to recreate in, in the city, and in, especially in the climate change um, time. So uh, this wilderness act shows uh, wilderness, uh, it defined wilderness as a kind of un undisturbed, untouched area by human, but we don't necessarily feel that uh, that kind of wilderness still exists anymore in, in, in the, in, in the, in, on the, around the world. So what kind of wilderness we need uh, in the city, like Seoul, in the climate change? So uh, as a kind of prototype of wilderness, we look at two places, which is DMZ, and the second one was Siberia. So I'm going to talk about some of the student work, how, how we approach to those wilderness, and how to create the um, kind of alternative nature within the city. So as we all know, DMZ is political limit that has four kilometer um, width. So we had career remade studio, um, alternative nature, DMZ, and hinterlands in uh, two years ago already. And then Siberia wilderness. For Siberia, the, the wilderness starts from the cultivation limit. So where they can uh, cultivate anything like potato, uh, always there has been human intervention. But th th those kind of land that has no use has been abandoned almost. And then uh, ironically, uh, that is now intact wilderness that is kind of very valuous, uh, the, the valuable piece of land for the human being these days. So um, now I think we all know where DMZ is. Some uh, very quick um, scale comparison between Central Park, DMZ, and Yosemite National Park. And I think this is kind of image of DMZ that usually foreign, uh, foreigners have. And many, most of the Koreans also have this kind of very uh, romanticized image of DMZ. But then if you, if you look at this number, so this is not the land price of DMZ or anything. This is the number of bombs that has been dropped during the Korean War in the Norigoji Jantu. Norigoji, Norigoji Jantu was one of the severe, most severe war that the battle be, uh, during the Korean War. And after that battle ends, the US Army kind of calculated how many bombs they used. And then it was uh, 1,500 per square meter and then 4,800 uh, per, per pyong. So it is a very chemically toxic land, the DMZ. But then it's still wilderness because it has been abandoned and no human um, were allowed except the surveillance armies uh, there. And then, of course, there has been regular periodical um, artificial firing to clear any uh, bushes for surveillance uh, purpose, by, both by uh, North Korea and Republic of Korea. So from there, we are, uh, uh, are interested in uh, border as a kind of potential uh, territory started. Um, and then we didn't believe only one type of nature exists. And then we wanted to look at kind of multiplicity of nature uh, defined by st each students. So first, the students uh, kind of re-territorialize. Re this is kind of new word that we created. So there was, there, there was no border before, and then now it's border. So we wanted to kind of reshuffle this area into each, the different territories. So we, we call it as a re-territorialization. And then uh, each student picked their own theme, and then they, they, uh, they, re re they reshuffle those uh, DMZ and its hinterland area. 그래서 열세 명 학생이 각자의 팀을 가지고 DMZ랑 그 일대를 제 영역화를 시켰어요. 그 다음에 그 사람들이 한그 학생들이 한게 뭐냐면 아이고 죄송해요. 그 다음에 이제 공간 전략을 짰어요. Then spatial strategies came. How to how to reorganize those area first, and then what kind of spaces places we are making because those area will be uh, actually at the center of the Korean Peninsula after 
reunification, and then there will be settlement and everything. And then what kind of specialty we want on top of the, uh, the, the territories? So first, the this, this students were, uh, we were at the observatory tower and the DMZ, the 전망대, 전망대 갔었는데, she was really struck by uh, those uh, kind of view shots created by the 전망대. So she kind of made these territories by view shot uh, after um, analyzing uh, terrain. And then she, she kind of thought that this kind of view shot, the kind of reshuffling by view shot, maintained the identity of DMZ as a kind of land of surveillance. And then at the same time, give this valid condition for a new settlement. And of course, we show this kind of Korean artist, this very famous Korean artist, Moon Bomb. And then I think students were using those as a kind of source of inspiration for their representation. So, okay, 한국 painting들도 보여주고, 그래서 이런, 어, 이제, 그, 썼죠. 예, representation. 네. 그래서 이 학생은 결국은 그걸 어떻게 했냐면, planting으로 한 거예요. So, her uh, special strategy was planting. Um, so, when we were at the DMZ area, we were just so inspired by those like very uh, scaleist, uh, scaleist condition because there's nothing in in the DMZ area. We just didn't. We were not able to scale how far the trees the, that tree is, and then how how that water line cl close to me. So she wanted to kind of interplay with those new planting and waterway to to create this uh, the sense of scale within DMZ. And then, uh, so she employs this this planting, and then she she chose mulberry and um, uh, poplar, which is uh, great for the fire remediation, the the, the soil cleaning. Um, and then she create a lot of uh, beautiful model. 그래서 지금 DMZ가 되게 스케일감이 없잖아요. 사람이 없고 아무도 없으니까 그래서 어, 포플러랑 뽕나무 같이 이제 그 소일, 소일 정화 작용이 있는 나무를 심어서 센스 오브 스케일을 만들어 준다는 게 이학생의 디자인이었어요. And the other the other uh, the other strategy was uh, territorialization was disturbance. So she thought both war and farming is a kind of most typical type of human disturbance to land. So she some, she firstly map the red is battleground around the DMZ during the Korean War, and then the green is the, the agricultural field that has been uh, cultivated for a long time. And both type of disturbance for her is good for uh, urban settlement because she wanted to keep other area as natural as possible. And then these are kind of most severely disturbed land in, in and around the DMZ. And of course, the disturbance has been done lately also because North and South also bombed their own um, Chuso, right? Um, so that kind of result, this kind of archipelago plan, that all this top area has been disturbed very much by human activity, which is battlefield and then agricultural field. And then, and then uh, the strategy she employed was a dark tourism, that how to deal with this landmines that cannot be detect detectable by uh, the metal detector because all this made in America, made, made in USA landmine cannot be detected by the metal detector because it's wrapped within a plastic case. Uh, but then she found this uh, Arabidopsis uh, plan. Uh, so her argument was if we drop the seed in the DMZ, you do, uh, you do turn into red if we detect any chemical chemical um, pollution. So once we seeding, uh, once we do aerial seeding of this plant, after some after some time passed, maybe the landscape of the landmine area will turn into red. And then we can. She said her, her strategy was to kind of focus that area as a kind of um, landmine explosion area. And then after a while that will create this kind of series of the con concave spaces that can hold water uh, at the end. So it will create kind of uh, the series of lake uh, landscape that can be used for the settlement framework uh, in the end. And also it can create the, the revenue for um, the settlement development because uh, we will need some money after unification, right? So she called it as a dark tourism. 
Another, uh, another strategy was uh, tiger, re re the restoration of tiger that uh, has been extinct in Korean Peninsula for a long time. Um, so uh, he, the Matt, Matt Wong, he, he researched about the Siberia tiger and then he realized tiger only lives uh, uh, higher than 500 meter altitude from the sea level. So he mapped out uh, the, the area above 500 meter. So we usually uh, see Korean Peninsula as a kind of divided into south and north, but then uh, he kind of made this uh, eastern ridge line as a kind of uh, new uh, new um, backbone of the of the Korea, the unif unified Korea, and then how to how to use it as a kind of uh, framework for the, the for the future settlement. And then of course, we, we are not saying that we need to have tigers in human, human settlements, but then he also designed specific border condition between uh, this uh, gray, darker area and then lighter gray area uh, by installing some landscape elements there so that it's not visible border, but somehow it protects human from tiger as well. And last one, uh, she, she, re she reshuffled the area by watershed. So this white area, so this, the, um, the white area, it's kind of watershed, bigger watershed. And then within those bigger watershed, she, she also find a recognized uh, micro watershed uh, that can be used for um, kind of uh, um, another kind of settlement. So after this mapping, she also uh, researched the geological condition of this watershed, and then she kind of overlay those two results, and then she she specifies certain area near DMZ where she can develop kind of spa village, that uh, be, and then because of the village will be set uh, the, you know, situated within the watershed, so that it has kind of environment of the the water water city. And then with the geological condition, she hoped that it can be developed into the spa area. And then this town will be uh, great for the people from the North Korea and also the tourists as well. And then she really uh, designed this land in very detail, all this contour design. And if you look at closely, she really developed. And also she was struck by this Korean culture of the the, um, the keryu and then like sonyotang those kind of uh, spa muna, spa culture. Right, um, so second studio project, uh, Siberia Wilderness, so cultivation limit, it has been. And then the, the studio called the Landscape of Transnationality. Mm -hmm. Let me just go a little bit faster. So uh, the initial idea was if the north and south border is, will be gone, we can actually travel from Busan to London within 10 days, right? So uh, that gives the idea about why don't we look at the Trans-Siberia Railway, which will take up seven days out of those 10 days, and then see what we can do. Because you know, railway is all kind of border, usually. And then uh, how to uh, kind of extend those the railway area into bigger areas so that the Siberia, which has been extracted for res natural resources, can be uh, more um, influential to this Eurasian con continent. 그래서 사이베리아 현대철도를 저희가 탔고요 학생들하고 음, 그래서 이게 그 서울하고 런, 부산에서 런던 사이 열흘로 본다면 사이베리아 현대 열차가 7일이에요 중간에 그래서 이 중에 3일을 저희가 탔어요 일쿠츠 일 아, 하바롭스크에서 일쿠츠크까지 이제 그게 3일이 왜 3일이냐면 제가 샤워를 안 하고 견딜 수 있는 <웃음> 날이 <웃음> 맥시멈 3일인 것 같아서 3일을 탔어요 네, 그래서 이제 철도도 어떻게 보면 보더니까 철도가 대부분 이렇게 위에 많이 이렇게 다이 같은데 많이 위치하거든요. 근데 이제 이거를 어떻게 그 지금 사이비아가 되게 무분별하게 그 뭐죠 이렇게 익스트랙트 하고 있어서 자연 리소스를 사이비아 철도를 기준으로 해서 어떻게 이제 그걸 영역을 영역 자체를 설계하고 새로 스테이션을 위치시키는지가 설계 과제였고요. So again, scale. We started from the scale comparison. London to Seoul is 14,000 km. American Amtrak is 5700 and then uh, TSR uh, uh, TSR is 3000 km and then those proper area is where we actually on board so you know 
in economical sense, uh, if we use Trans-Siberian Railway to ship something from Busan to London, it'll, it'll be uh, one third of time, and then the, the cost will be also one third of the cost of uh, ship. And then the, the, the assignment was to uh, imagining new station branching out of uh, the TSR line, and then uh, design a framework around the station uh, where it can be reconnected to the nature, surrounding nature. So I think we have like 180 something nations in the world. But if we think about uh, ecoregions, we have eight, more than 850 ecoregions in the world. So there, there we came up with this transnationality that the border between nations doesn't really uh, do anything to, uh, sometimes it's really hostile, but then these ecoregions even don't have any specific borders, but they always kind of intermingle with each other. And then I found I thought that it has it gives more opportunity to us. So even during the three three day travel from Havarovsk to Irkutsk, we were um, supposed to going through twelve different uh, ecoregion borders. And then I'll show you the photo. Those borders are not really uh, uh, very clear-cut borders, but sometimes it's mo much more ecologically rich and abundant in terms of ecology and, and other experience as well. And then, uh, so we used two methodologies in terms of design. So first of all, we wanted to uh, think about, uh, I wa we want the students to think about how to, how to actually uh, design station is a kind of culminate, cul culminating point of travel. Because you know, if you travel from all the way from the, the, the bloody boat stop to uh, St. Petersburg is seven days, but then it's usually the same landscape every time. So how station can uh, provide uh, the kind of climax of your travel experience. And then uh, this is the drawing done by uh, Dr. Piasewski for uh, Paris Expo in 1900 for a Russian pavilion. And then she, he, his doctor, his medical doctor, and then he traveled all the way through the Siberia Railway, uh, the potential Siberia Railway, uh, the, the route for a promotional reasons. So she, uh, he, he depicted all this beautiful landscape and then how to design the route itself uh, will shape this experience of the passengers. That's what she, he, uh, he, uh, he pursued other people. And then this panorama painting is now ex in exhibition in St. Petersburg um, Museum. And then, so I want my students to look at those drawings and then uh, kind of uh, create this kind of representation for the mid-review by uh, selecting six existing stations between um, Busan and London. 그래서 이게 이제 1900년 파리 엑스포 때 러시아 파빌리온에 전시된 디자인 그 파노라마 드로잉이에요. 당시 이제 피아사스키라는 분이 그린 건데 8km 정 8km 돼요. 그 실제 길이가 아니야 8km가 아닌데 800 800 800m 죄송해요. So 800 long panorama drawing. And then 그래서 이걸 가지고 러시아가 이제 돈을 인베스트먼트를 모았어요. 왜냐면 그 당시에 한 반만 지고 돈이 없어서 마저 반을 못 찍고 있었기 때문에 이거를 이용해서 이제 막 프로모션을 해서 그 당시에 막 미국이랑 유럽에서 투자 많이 받아서 어그 반절을 마저 지울 수 있었죠. 그래서 학생들한테 이제 뭘 하게 했냐면 이런 어 이걸 보, 보고 영감을 받아서 어 어떻게 스테이션이 이제 이런 좋은 판그 여행의 경험을 줄수 있는지 디자인해 보라고 그랬고 그래서 이제 미드 리뷰 때 학생들이 팀을 짜서 어, 스테이션을 다섯 개 정, 여섯 개 정한 다음에 그거를 그 주변, 그러니까 arriving experience, departing experience를 디자인하라고 했어요. 주변 경관을. 네. So some of them made this kind of uh, uh, locomotive uh, model, and then some of them made this kind of panoramic uh, framework. And the second methodology we employed was mapping. So we mapped, uh, so each student had their theme and then map out their own topic uh, with same scale with Daedong Yeojido, which is Korean oldest real map uh, made by Kim Jong-ho. And there's only like three uh, colored copies existing in the world. And then one of them are actually in the in Yanshin Library in Harvard GSD. So I took the students to Yanshin Library and then showed this Daedong Yeojido 
uh, which is kind of 22 little booklet, folded booklet. And then um, luckily we were able to make same scale, which is 170,000 scale for that, uh, the, the, the route between Habarov to Irkutsuk. So they printed out the, those map into the same scale and then they folded it like Kim Jong-ho did, and then they took it to our travel. So they were actually they were able to compare what they were thinking in the studio in actual, during the, the, the travel. Uh, so it was really amazing moment to look at the Daedong Yeojido. So those are the maps that students created has all different topic, and then later on they used that as a framework for their study, the design. So this is me holding the maps uh, in the carriage. All the snow that shows the side area. Uh, yeah, so we had workshop in the carriage um, and then the students were discussing. So this is a landscape I take photo from my train. So this is where the echo region of uh, Taiga becomes step. And then as you see, there's no you know, border of any regions or anything. It even creates more interesting landscape, the kind of mixture of the taiga and steppe. And very scaleless landscape again, we are not just able to uh, judge how far those hills are from the train. So the sense of scale just totally got lost. So I wanna show two students work and then I'm gonna finish up. So uh, the first students uh, did the Siberia retreat, uh, nursery retreat. So, uh, you know, it was really interesting to see 70% of timber uh, consumed in the, in the world at this moment has been um, cut off in Siberia area, Siberia, especially along the, the Trans-Siberia Railway because it's really easy to, you know, uh, export. So along the, the train railway, there's a lot of already like barren, barren ground. And uh, these students were found, found that really interesting and very serious problem. But at the end, it's the biggest industry the Saib area has. So we cannot just say uh, that you have to stop uh, timber extraction because it's not very good for nature, right? So his idea was uh, to, to map out those, those, so kind of this white area is kind of timber extraction area where no green coverage at all remained. Uh, and then, so his idea was uh, use those barren ground as a kind of nursery so that uh, we, can, uh, they, we can grow smaller trees there. And then once the trees reach a certain height, uh, the, his idea was to transplant those trees to other areas of uh, timber extraction. So uh, those, those, those timber field actually acting as a kind of um, uh, tree growing uh, nursery. And then at the same time, those, uh, the, those a new train station will be uh, located within those nursery. And then uh, he, he hoped that those station also can be used as a kind of retreat for human. And then he also even designed this carriage for the tree, 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 um, um, tree shipment from the nursery to other, other uh, new nurseries. The carriage design. And then he also designed this uh, arrival and departing experience by this model, this overlay of model, uh, by with this interval of the certain distance. So this is a 1,500 1, scale framework to, to show how to locate those nursery area and station within the existing forest. And then more detailed plan. So the, this red screen is kind of th uh, two meter high. And uh, because Siberia is problematic, the wind, very strong wind is kind of problematic for the small trees. So his idea was this red screen will protect the, the smaller trees, uh, the seedlings from, uh, from the strong uh, wind gust. And then after reaching some, uh, after even the, the bigger trees got transplanted to other area, those uh, pink, uh, those red, red 
element will be remaining there to as a kind of signature of uh, those nursery history history of nursery the last project was uh, the stations for saving permafrost 제가 언젠가부터 한국말을 안 하고 있는데 이따가 Q&A 때 물어보시면 제가 말씀드릴게요. So the station is for saving permafrost. So permafrost is a permanently frozen uh, geological layer, uh, especially uh, the most of the permafrost in Siberia. And um, because of the climate change, many of them has been uh, melt. And it has been really problematic because when the permafrost get melt, it uh, emits CO2 and methane gas that is not existing at this moment. So that gas were kind of captured at the time that the layer has been frozen, which is like 1,000 or 10,000 years before. And then the, our current science cannot deal with those gas. So that's the problem of the, the permafrost of Siberia. So uh, what she did, so 동토층이 이제 사이베리아에 있는데 걔네가 지금 녹고 있는 거예요, 클라이밋 체인지 때문에. 근데 이제 클라이밋, 동토층이 녹은 문제가 뭐냐면 거기에 옛날 몇백 년 전에 거기 갇혔던 메탄 가스 같은 게 올라와서 지금 현대 과학으로 그게 이제 해결이 안 되고 있는 게 문제예요, 사이베리아에. 그래서 이 친구는 지금 그걸 얘기하고 있는데 so she made a lot of drawings. So her first drawing was what she did was what she found was really interesting. So one of the Russian scientists found that uh, the mammals, the really big mammals, migrate from north to south in winter to search their food, right? And then those stamping of mammals because they're huge and very heavy, the stamping really make the ground hard. So it kind of pushed back the kind of thawing of the permafrost. So it has been kind of sci scientifically proved. So what she did was she overlaid those mammal uh, uh, migration routes uh, with the permafrost, uh, perma permafrost area uh, near the Siberia, the, train, the railway. So what she did was she, she kind of redesigned the, 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 she kind of made a guideline of where the mammals can be moving because mammals, they, they don't really move around by themselves. They always have this the guidance, 목동. 목동이 항상 있어요. 그래서 어차피 목동들이 몰고 가는 거기 때문에 충분히 그 migration path를 디자인할 수 있는 거죠. 그래서 한개 migration path를 디자인했는데 그게 이제 마침 지금 그 permafrost에 녹고 있는 거기에 디자인했어요. 그래서 멤버들이 움직여서 stamping 그 쿵쿵거리는 걸로 땅을 다져주고 그렇게 되면 이제 permafrost가 어, 녹는 것이 더 되질 것이다. 이제 그런 게이 사람의 디자인 아이디어였고요. Her conceptual model. Um, so this was her her um, design that she made this station uh, kind of 200 kilometer above the front, branched off from the main line, and then this was the area of the sporadic uh, permafrost. Sp sporadic permafrost means in the summer it would be kind of water water area, and then in the winter it would be frozen again. But then she kind of want, turned into uh, be. Uh, permanently frozen again by uh, inducing this movement of the mammal by creating the gauging station and also uh, the station, railway station. So this is uh, her her rendering for the sporadic permafrost. And then she, she made the station above the ground level so that the mammals can uh, go around without being disturbed by the train. And then that's kind of train station she's designed. And then the, you can see the memo still moving around the station. And then grazing station. There's some views that she imagined. Oh, so I think this is last slide. So, uh, so that, that's been what I've been doing in terms of border and territory issue uh, through my practice and research in, in, in the GSD. And this is our uh, my recent topic, rewilding. So, you know, of course, to rewild something, I have to know what to rewild, right? And then what is the kind of wild status that I'm imagining? So going back to the Tanchan competition, the urban hydrology, those kind of issue uh, is something that we are uh, exploring at this moment. And again, uh, any borders uh, can be uh, extended into territory. That's still what I um, what I believe. 
So I think, I hopefully it was interesting to you too. 감사합니다. <웃음> 제가 한국말을 한 대놓고서 안 해서 죄송해요. <웃음> 하다 보니까 어떻게 이렇게. 아, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, I even even though even though Jung Yoo mentioned that she somewhat had to structure and uh, frame her works uh, related to the topic of photos that we are dealing with now, but it seems that uh, that uh, what she, what she or they have been doing already implied this uh, effort of how to either break the border or uh, expand the border or resolve the border or dissolve the border. I think that's very interesting. And, and also at the same time, it's not just about the, the design, but also about their uh, their roles in, in, the, in the field and uh, how, how they can blur uh, the, the boundary between the uh, professionals, as you mentioned, that 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 uh, uh, the moment that you came back from the Netherlands. Now I I recall that you 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 work at West State for mm -hmm. a long time, right? Because I I did an internship there at West State in 2007 or something, and everybody was asking me that, hey, no, so do you know Jong Yun and Lee? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, who are they? <laughs> but but they're uh, they're already superstars. So, but but I the I, I don't know whether you know what they but I, that you should know. But I think that also relates to what uh, she meant that some people conceive what state as a landscape architect, but uh, some people like me conceive them as a urban designers, and they also do architecture. So her kind of. Uh, pro, uh, Practice was also already, uh, to say, in the at, at a farm that merges all these uh, different professionals. So I think that's very interesting. But anyway, so uh, is there any uh, questions? Any any questions? Well, I'm just gonna keep this on the floor. Uh, I was really interested in your mapping um, project um, on the Trans-Siberian Railway. Mm -hmm. um, in our previous sessions, we were talking about, you know, when we go on site research and like how much research is enough research, like what is, how do we do justice to the subject that we're researching? I guess we're talking in the context of people or how they live, I guess, maybe more in the architecture and urban sense. And I was wondering, like, you know, when you're on a train and you're moving so fast, um, how do you kind of slow down time? And what do you know what to look for? Because I imagine, like, um, Haberovsk and Irkutsk, I just watched in a documentary, those are, like, the main stations on the railway. So I'm wondering, like, how you interacted with nature. And I think some of us, like, as we're going into this, we're, like, thinking about our final project and, like, kind of thinking about what we should kind of look at when we're, like, thinking about borders, like we all are all are kind of interested in like how to examine our subjects and how to engage in research that maybe we're not super knowledgeable of. So um, I kind of want to know like if you went into it like with assumptions or with knowledge like mm. that you did research on previous Yeah, I think, I think I know what you mean. <clears throat> so um, um, I think that's a really good question. So I think that that's what that's how design research should be different from academia research. So like during the PhD, always they always like study what other people have done, and then they just need to put one layer on top of that. So for PhD dissertation, any PhD dissertation is not end product. It's kind of in the process of their. Uh, lifetime research, right? But I think what's important for design research is you really have to have what is the end result that you want. And you have to have your own goal. So for example, like Siberia, I've never been to Russia even, right? I've never been to China, I mean, I've been to China, but I've never been to Russia. And I think 
many of students are actually had this both uh, excitement and fear about going to Siberia, which is also for my case. So, uh, and then, um, so even, even though, so it was really even very critical for me and my students that we have to know what we are look, looking for before we go into Siberia. So that's why we, I kind of asked them to have very specific them that they want to research and they want to look at when we go to Siberia and Russia uh, so that they don't have to like be uh, lost. And I think that's, that's not just for Siberia, but for my practice as well. We always start with research, but we kind of know what, what we want to do in the end. So when I go to sites, what I'm trying to do is I always I have something uh, very, uh, a very uh, a specific, um, very specific image of what I want to design in my head. So my research is kind of already can be geared toward that end result. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I think it's very important that during the design process, you always have to simplify your idea and thinking, and you always have to go back what was your initial idea. Otherwise, you can easily uh, be lost. How do you deal with like unexpected findings or observations? That's that's great. That's great source of inspiration. So you always so so th that doesn't mean that you you cannot change your initial idea. So your idea always evolve, but it's always uh, good to have something that you want to look for, and then your final final goal. Of course, you can change your mind, but uh, and then and then you can always open up yourself to this new finding, unexpected something exciting. Uh, but still, I think you have to have your uh, your end 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 goal and design. Alternative nature가 바로 그거거든요. 사실 지금 untouched wilderness는 없어요 지구상에. 남극 북극도 사실은 untouched가 아니잖아요. 
근데 그럼에도 불구하고 상대적인 울더니스는 항상 있기 마련이거든요. 그래서 저희는 이제 랜스케이프 아키텍츠는 원래 처음 시작이 자연을 모사하는 사람으로 시작을 한 거고 모사하면서 시작했거든요. 그러니까 산업혁명 이후에 이제 워낙 도시 환경이 안 좋아지니까 뭐 뉴욕이나 독일 같은 데서 이제 머리 나가지 않아도 도시 안에 말하자면 자연을 이제 내가 나무 한 그루도 있는 거 그런 거가 있기, 있는 곳을 만들기 시작하면서 사실은 랜스케이 아키텍트라는 명칭을 먼저 나왔고 그 다음에 이제 랜스케이 아키텍트가 하는 일을 랜스케이 아키텍처라고 부르기 시작했거든요. 예, 원래 어벽이라는 게 그렇게 나왔어요. 그래서 이제 이 랜스케이 아키텍트라는 사람들이 하는 것이 말하자면 인공물을 만드는 거였죠. 우리가 뭐 어, 그런 이컬러지스트처럼 레스토레이션 하는 사람들이 아니니까. 그 사실 저는 제가 바로 지금 보고 있는 게 그거예요. 저는 그 그러니까 네이처를 레스토레이션을 하는 게제 목적은 아니고 어, 제가 작년 얼마 전에 저희 학교에서 한 강의에 그런 게 있어요. 400년 동안 그 말하자면 복원을 숲을 했는데 그린랜드에서 400년을 해도 예전 상태로 안 돌아간대요. 그러니까 400년 동안 복원된 숲이 겉보기에는 완벽하게 옆이랑 비슷한데 그 좋은 다양성을 비교해 보면 현저히 떨어지는 거예요. 사실은 레스토레이션이라는 거는 우리 인간 경험이나 삶과는 저희가 할수 있는 영역을 벗어나고 다만 우리가 할수 있는 거는 자연의 경험을 크리에이트하는 거랑 그다음에 자연의 시스템을 인공적으로 만들어내는 거는 전 되게 가능하다고 보고 그게 사실 제가 지금 하고 있는 이제 리서치가 그런 거거든요. 그러니까 making of alternative nature. 지금 이제 아까 보여줬던 그런 이제 탄천의 그 이제 <웃음> 지하 지하 하이드로러지가 어떻게 만들어질 수 있는지 그런 게 제가 하고 있는 거예요. 더 이상은 이제 artificial하고 nature, artifact하고 nature의 경계는 어, 저는 없다고 봐요. 네. 네. 없다고 보고 어, 저는 사실 근데 사실은 이게 이제 아까 임 소장님 말씀하신 것처럼 네덜란드 영향이 좀큰것 같아요. 네덜란드든 더치들은 그 모든 자연을 제가 만들면서 살아왔잖아요. 그래서 어, 그때 아드리안이 이제 그런 얘기를 했었어요. 자기네한테는 올게닉은 스트레이트를 얘기한다고. 근데 이제 대부분 다른 컬처에서는 올게닉은 되게 이렇게 시니어스한 선을 말하잖아요. 근데 더치들한테는 그 수로들, 네, 되게 그 스트레이트 자기는 올게닉이라고. 근데 저는 사실은 어, 되게 여러 경험을 하면서 그런 네이처나 이런 거에 대한 죄의식 같은 건 없는 것 같아요. 근데 이제 조경이 되게 선 영향을 끼칠 수 있다고 믿고 그리고 이제 그렇게 하기 위해서는 타분야들하고 협업이 되게 필수적이죠. 엔지니어들하고. 그, 그, uh, just adding a uh, additional question that I have to you uh, and to this question is, then uh, would you say that uh, what uh, what you are doing or what landscape architects are doing uh, always in, involve uh, people, people's experience? Sure. Yes, so that's to, the point. That's the point. That's the point. So, uh, so ecologists, maybe I'm just making this too simplified, but <laughs> ecologists think about ecology and animal. But I think for landscape architect, always have to create space for people, right? So I think that's the kind of main difference that uh, I have to think about how human can uh, occupy the space. But at the same time, ruining nature is not beneficial for human in, in the end. So we have to consider both. But I think uh, the, the top consideration is always in human experience and how this can be occupied as a habit, uh, human, human settlements and things like that.
사실 저는 보존과 개발이 바이너리라고 생각하지 않거든요. 근데 저는 또 자본을 나쁜 거라고 생각하지 않고 물론 여태까지 개발 형태가 대부분이 납부에 되어온 건 사실이죠. 그러니까 뭐 이제 너무나 쉽게 생각할 수 있는 게 이제 통일이 되면 일단 DMG 싹 밀고, 밀고 시작할 가능성이 되게 크고 평평하게. 근데 이제 그래서 저희가 이, 저희 스튜디오는 사실은 포스트 유니피케이션 시나리오라기보다는 프리 유니피케이션 시나리오라고 보는 게 맞아요. 그러니까 땅을 먼저 만져놓은 다음에 영역화를 시켜놓은 다음에 거기에 이제 아파트를 줘도 줘라, 줘라 이거죠. 그러니까 예를 들자면 아까 이제 그 머러쉐드 그 유역 분지로 한 친구의 이걸 보면 아 그러니까 이것도 보면 마찬가지죠. 그러니까 만약에 이제 도시를 만들어야 된다면 이왕이면 이 빨간색이랑 초록색을 만들으라는 거예요. 이 연두색 부분 하지 말고 이제 그런 그런 거죠. 어 그리고 뭐 이런 다른 매핑도 보면 일단 지뢰가 먼저 묻혀 있던 곳은 결국은 되게 케미컬이 많은 곳이니까 그걸 그거를 쓰기보다는 지뢰는 지뢰끼리 모아서 한 군데서 탁 터트린 다음에 거기를 그냥 레이크화 시키자는 거예요. 그러면 이제 레이크 레이크들이 막 인, 말하지, 말하자면 핀란드처럼 레이크들이 막 있으면서 그 레이크 없는 랜드 부분에 도시가 생기겠죠. 근데 그런 이제 얼버니즘을 생각을 하는 거고 사실은 이제 어, 그런 의미가 있었다고 봐요. 이 스튜디오가 어, 이것도 이제 그런 경계를 어떤 평지냐 슬로비냐로 나누는 게 아니라 보통 이 평지 뭐, 뭐 0부터 2% 사이의 슬롭은 개발 가능성이 높은 부지라고 보니까 이제 그렇게 하지 말고 유역 분지로 보면 나중에 이제 도시의 어떤 그런 드라니지 문제라든지 이런 거를 나중에 다시 생각할 필요가 없게 되는 거죠. 그래서 사실 이거는 프리 유니피케이션 시나리오라고 봐요. 청와대 빨리 이거 보내드려야 되는데 <웃음> 지금 정신이, 네. 정신이 항상 없으시죠. 그게 제일 걱정이에요. 그러니까 작년에 GOP 터트리는 것도 너무 안타까웠잖아요. 네, 그거 사실은 보존해야 되는 건데 근데 이제 그럴 때그 전에 논의했던 수많은 논의들이 그냥 다 없어지는 거잖아요. 네, 그래서 어떻게 할지는 저희 어떻게 이걸 전달해 드릴지 모르겠지만 하여튼 그래서 되게 중요하다고 봐요. 그래서 그 영역, 영역을 먼저 만드는 게 중요하고 보더를, 보더를 이제 그 힌터랜드로 확장시키는 영역들 그 프레임워크 만들어줘야죠. 결국은 그게 결국은 어, 이코노미컬한 포인트로도 좋다고 봐요. 결국은 요즘 무슨 사람들이 평지에만 살고 살기 원하지 않잖아요. 네. 집 방이 다들 됐나요? <웃음> Any question from from you guys? No, <웃음> nothing. 네네네. 그 초반에 윌더니스랑 이제 아가니즘 이제 문법으로 만들어주는데, 리 테리토리얼라이제이션이 그 윌더니스에서 정의 접근이라면, 윌더니스 정의 접근이 될지 몰랐겠죠. 윌더니스 정의 접근이라면, 이게 몇몇 프로젝트 같은 경우에는 뭐. 토리즘이라든가 뭔가 그 스파 렌즈를 만드는 것들이 있었는데 그거는 얼바니즘이랑 비슷한 방식으로 보여서 만약에 재형 역할하는 게 리더이스적 접근이라면 그 계획안들이 얼바니즘과 어떻게 차이점이 있는지 다음 궁금합니다. 저 근데 리더이스적 접근이라는 게 뭐죠? 그 자연 자, 어떤 게 외전이스적 접근이라고 지금 얘기하셨죠? DMZ를 자연으로 보존하는 접근. 아, 약간 이것도 개발과 보존이야 이런 얘기인가요? 좀? 아, 네. 음, 그, 그래서요? <웃음> <웃음> 질문이 질문이 뭐죠? 아, 아, 저 죄송한데 좀더 클리어하게 얘기를 해주시면 더 좋을 것 같아서. 제가 어떤 거가 더 원하는 건가요? 아니면 뭐죠? 그... 시베리아 프로젝트나 DMZ 프로젝트 이제 재형력한 작업 자체가 예, 예, 예. 예. 윌더니스가 자연에 도전한다는 개념으로 접근하고 가라면 아, 네. 예. 그게 어바니즘 예. 접근에 다르지 않아 보이는데 그게 윌더니스 접근이라고 할수 있는가? 일단은 
그게 의전실 접근이 아닌 것 같고요. 그러니까 사실은 그 제가 이제 얘기했지만 그거를 저는 물다니스라는 게 되게 막 이렇게 신성 불가침의 그런 거를 저는 생각 안 하고 아 어떤 결국은 이제 랜스케이프 아키텍처나 아키텍처가 해야 될 일이 음 우리가 살아갈 곳을 만드는 게 일이잖아요. 그죠? 각, 각 직, 직업분들이 하는 일이 있으니까. 에, 그런데 이제 제 입장은 이제까지는 그런 어떤, 어, 뭐, 뭐라 그러지? 우리가 잃어버린 거? 월다니스는 아니면 뭐 잃어버린 황야라든지 네이처나 이런 것들을 예전에는 고민을 안 했다면 이제는 그거를 해야 되지 않나. 왜냐면 사실 2050년까지 우리나라도 그린하우스 가스 영을 만들어야 되는 그 파리 조약에 설명을 한 나라거든요. 근데 과연 그게 될지는 사실 굉장히 미지수죠. 영, 뭐, 10도 아니고 영을 만들어야 되니까. <웃음> 근데 이제 그걸 하려면 뭐, 이제 분리수거도 하고 다 하지만 과연 우리가 공간과 자연을 다루는 건축이나 조경에서 분명히 뭔가를 계속 해나가고 있어야 지 된다고 생각하는데 과연 이제 아무도 안 하고 있으니까 거의. 어, 근데 결국은 음, 아까 제가 보여드린 그런 퇴계로 말리제로의 포장 디자인 있잖아요. 그거 전혀 관계 없어 보이지만 되게 관계 있는 거거든요. 어, 그게 사실은 투스 포장을 써도 투스 블록도 6개월 지나면 다 막혀요. 공극이 우리나라 물이 더러워서 러너프가 더러워서 그러니까 어떤 그런 제품으로 해결이 안 된다는 거예요. 기본적 결국은 땅을 일단 잘 만져야 되고 구배가 잘 잡혀야 되고 되게 기본적인 것들이 잘 돼야 되거든요. 그래야 물이 제대로 모여서 그 이제 도시의 파미어빌리티가 투수율이 높아지고 결국은 그래야 이제 밑에 쌉소일이 물을 많이 담게 되고 아무리 영동대로 해서 물을 많이 퍼올려도 결국은 대수층에 물이 많이면 밸런스가 맞아, 맞아줄 수 있거든요. 근데 이제 여태까지는 그 워러 밸런스 생각 안 하고 계속 우리가 쓰기만 했잖아요, 물을. 근데 이제 우리가 그런 조경 설계나 이런 것들에서 모두가 다 같이 이런 노력을 좀 하더라도 하면 결국은 결국은 보탬이 될수 있다고 저는 그걸 믿, 믿거든요. 그러니까 우리 직업의 파워 그거를 그러니까 그, 다시 그, 처음으로 그, 한, 한천 프로젝트가 네. 아마 설명을 잘 해주실 것 같아요. 네, 네. 그 아까도 설명하신 것처럼 이게 어떤 양분화된 음, 게 아니라 음, 한천 음. 프로젝트 누가 보면 어마어마한 개발 프로젝트지만 그 안에서 어떻게 하면 자연의 흐름을 이 시스템 안으로 같이 들어오는 거가 되게 기쁜 그렇죠. 것 같아요. 그렇죠. 예. 근데 이제 m b r d 가 이렇게 했지 잘 모르겠어요. <웃음> 안 했죠. <했겠죠. 웃음> 그래서 어, 예, 하여튼 그래요. 답이 됐는지 모르겠는데 음, 제가 하고 싶은 말은 그거 그거 한거 같아요. 한번 해볼게요. 네. 뭐요? 이거 또. 아, <웃음> 욕심 있으시네. <웃음> 아니, 이게 다음 볼수 있어요. 아 이거 이게 뭐야? 네, 다른 분. 혹시 답부터 들었니? 네. 아 질문이 너무 많아 좋네요. 응. 여기는 질문이 많아. 아, 어떤 질문? 아, I have two question. One is very simple. Uh, about the landscape project, the sh- landscape studio that you did. I was just wondering about the timing of the studio. Is it after reunification or is it during the process of reunification or is it before the reunification? What's the time? So, as I just mentioned, it's pre-unification scenario. So, uh, we wanted to provide kind of framework for any future settlement. Because, you know, once, let's say, North and South agreed to open up the border, right? And then human, human movement will immediately start. And then maybe some, some people from North Korea want to move down to South. And maybe some, some people from our country to also go further to north, right? But then this DMZ area will be immediately occupied by someone. And how we gonna occupy the land is something the landscape architect can suggest. That's kind of premise of the studio. So to be able to guide any future modification of the physicality of the land, we have to provide, we have to actually think already how the area will be reshuffled. So the studio is about pre-unification scenario. It's not post-unification scenario. And another question is that uh, since I, I, I've been raised by a Christian family, I like, 
I don't like to go to pray. I don't like to go to church for pray. I like to go to church to see like the structures and the buildings. And I, I just saw your the Tosong Memorial mm-hmm. Program. Mm-hmm. I was I've been there like four days ago, yes. and I felt that uh, that building was really nice. It has like uh, what uh, or my interpret- interpretation, it was like. The secret weapon that they suggested for the competition was like uh, ambiguous of the disti- uh, floor distinction and the voting system, the modern voting system, and the sec- the third one was uh, like a grand code, yeah? But what, what, I'm, I was just curious, what was your uh, competition like uh, secret weapon? What did you suggest for the competition? For my initial interpretation, just at the render shot, there was like a direct sunlight uh, penetrate, penetrate through the praying room, mm-hmm. and I've been to a lot of church like outside of Korea, like, like Europe, mostly Europe. But I never had seen like those uh, kind of uh, at this type of like church interiors. So I was quite interested. I was also like uh, curious about the intentions of this like, room and other uh, what. Yeah, so I think, um, so Korea, we don't have any one, like, one religion. We are very, we are very diversified in terms of our, the choice of religions, right? And then I believe, so that's why I didn't put any, like, cross symbol or anything on top of the ground level. And I think that's why also I put all the religious program into the sub subground. I'm also Christian, but I know how it, how controversial it can be if I show anything religious kind of symbols on top of the and also because we have that. Uh, oh my God, I forgot the name of the songdang. The the songdang that is existing right next to this area. The the oldest songdang of Korea. Yakin songdang. Yakin songdang. Because we already have that very historical Yakun Songdang. I didn't want to design anything kind of competing with Yakun Songdang. So, um, and I believe this history of Catholic, Korean Catholic for the last 200 is also history of modernization of Korea. So this is, I, I wanted to make this area much more than for one religion. And I, I believe that in that way, uh, we can create bigger sympathy of uh, above this area. And then people will realize, oh, there has been this very tragic um, history of Catholic in Korea. So I wanted to kind of gradually bring people's attention into the underground, and then suddenly they have this very grand experience of sunlight coming down. And, then, and I also, it was quite economical uh, proposal as well, because we were using most of the underground parking garage that was already existing. And, um, but, uh, uh, but um, what can I say? I mean, I, but I'm really glad that I heard the memorial built really in good way and very well, well built. Um, because it's so bad whenever I see the winning scheme is really badly built that for the competition I lost. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm glad this has been successful anyway. We, we have some architects as well, but mostly uh, yeah, landscape. Yeah, but what I thought is it's better designing a space or building. It's making a strategy for a uh, situation or to solve some problems, which was very, very, very interesting for me. And uh, yeah, so I was wondering it's just because because we do mostly deal with the space, mm-hmm. building, build, uh, building some projects, like apartments, something, something. So I was curious, it's 
uh, the difference is two and two majors. So what's the first thing? Um, second thing is different between landscape and architecture. Yeah, yeah. About the projects. Okay. Or uh, <laughs> just a method of processes, or they really be like. Oh, do you, do you want me to answer first? Okay. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and what's the second? Uh, uh, the second is, and then if, uh, it, in reality, the two projects uh, will, will be rel highly related to like public development projects. And it will, uh, so I think there should be a lot of collaborations from different fields, different mm -hmm. fields. So, I was curious how, yeah, how much architecture or landscape architect, architecture and landscape architect could uh, uh, say or make difference in that project in in large view. Mm -hmm. So I think for the first question, um, um. I don't know because I never been educated for in any architectural program, but in GSD we have a lot of interdepartment relationships. So, what I uh, and also I have a lot of architect architect friends, including Tungu. I think if if uh, in any good design institution, there's actually no huge difference between architectural education and landscape education, especially for the first years. The so first year design school is always usually in, in, for in, in case of GSD. Uh, I think the both core studio always um, uh, instruct students to think about the very basic element of space. So I think, uh, and we always start from the spatial element and then going into like more specified programs, how to imply those programs. I think I can. What I can say is how how landscape architecture are fundamentally different from architecture. Uh, usually in landscape architecture, we don't really have required program. So first of all, for architect, you have to have roof for <laughs> for house, right? And you have to have uh, FIR. FIR and ceiling. Even if we don't have any FIR, you have to have wall, right, to protect the wind, for example. But in landscape architecture, usually we don't have any required program. So we act, we some we many times have to uh, make our own problem and then solve the problem also. So we have to have to do this jada usually. And uh, it's not always easy. So, so for me, most difficult project is always garden project. Because a garden project is kind of starting from the white paper, really. So for designing a park, we usually have kind of a mandated program from the city and also the, the people. So like we want entrance here, and then there's some circulations, and then for ADA condition, the older ramp need to be less than 5% inclination for, for, cert, for sort of thing. But the garden project is the most difficult thing. So there's actually no, no um, and in many cases, I have to communicate with the owner uh, to know what kind of aesthetic they have and what is the kind of spatial solution um, I can suggest sort of thing. So I think that's the kind of biggest difference between architecture and landscape architecture. Can, can I add one yeah, more? Yeah, sure. Something that I was also, I had a similar question when I went to GSD and then something that I learned was that landscape architects always think about the long-term phase longer than the architects do. So mostly architects think that, okay, this will be done, whatever, in five years, it will look like this. And then if, it, if you're lucky, it will, be the, it will look the same in 50 years, something like that, <laughs> if not demolished, whatever, right? But, but landscape architects always think oh, way, way longer term, that, oh, you look like this in the next five years, you look like the other in the next, 20 years, you look different in the next 50 years or something. So I, I think that's very important then, the, the way how you look into or look at one subject. Mm -hmm. I was just adding. Yeah, that's a good point. 
What was, what the, was second? the second question? <laughs> what was the second question? That's why she asked you to answer for <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Uh, the second was actually if we really do that products in reality. Uh, ah. Yeah, so so how much how much how much say do architects and landscape architects have in uh, in this type of let's say of projects where a lot of other professionals or politics or all these uh, are going to be involved? Uh, well, so I think both architects and landscape architects, what we have in common is we always have to have clients. We always have to have someone who give our us project. I think that's the biggest difference between art and architecture. So artists usually do whatever they want uh, unless they have some gallery or museum sp sponsor them. Um, and then if someone interested in their art, they buy their art as it, as it is, right? But uh, architecture and landscape architecture, architects always have to have someone who give project to us to initiate the design process. So it is true that uh, we cannot really initiate anything. So for example, like if, even if I have all this beautiful uh, DMZ proposal, I cannot really do anything unless the government let me do, do something. But, uh, but then why I'm doing this, all this speculative work, uh, actually there's, some, there's one of the questions that I, I, got, I got from one of my studio students for the Siberia students asked me. Uh, the, per the student asked me, well, after graduation, I'm not going to deal with all this like big scale project, but then why I have to do this? Uh, but then I, but I still believe that the, the gar a garden designed by someone who doesn't have any idea about climate change uh, cannot, cannot do well compared to design, the, compared to a garden designed by a landscape architect who has idea about climate change. So even if we, we cannot initiate our own project, we still have to have our own uh, agenda and speculation always, kind of supported by research, uh, and then consideration of what's going on in, in around, our, around the, the world is very important. Thank you for the lecture, Constable. And uh, before I ask a question, actually, I brought my friend who is doing a project about Penyan Dari project right now, and he's like struggling with it. So I think you should find some help because he does a big, wonderful lecture. Penyan Dari project, what is it? The Nodal Summit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, anyway. Um, did, oh, you, did, did, did you win the competition? Uh, actually, I was, I don't know, the project in the middle of the project. So I missed the opportunity to step up. So I did now I'm the engaging project, but before handing it over to the project. Oh, great. My the question is that um, so it, uh, one of the interesting part is that these different works are actually based like like studio is in US. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very like students have a neutral like thought. Like for example, all the Korean people have like like political bias. I think. Uh -huh. I think yeah. US students, I think they don't have those kind of bias. So. They might feel some kind of restriction mm -hmm. because, like, they don't live here. They don't. I think even though they try to do many research, they still feel they need some kind of context. Mm -hmm. And so, like for instance, like we did a lot of like, like studies in this um, school, such as like German-Russian pipe like um, fights, mm -hmm. like or the like Vietnam like Chinese border thingy. But even though we try our best, we think like it's some kind of like um, it's hard for us to make a decision. But 
but after I like, saw this lecture, it just came up my mind that maybe they could start their idea because like without bias, so they could like yeah their imagination sure. is so like so big. Yes. So can you um, explain? Yeah. In I think that's a really good question. I mean, I <clears throat> that's also what I really enjoyed running the studio in GSD. So I can I can give you one episode. So during the DMG student studio, um, <clears throat> we have we have eight Chinese students out of thirteen. So the biggest number of Chinese stu and no students. And no Korean actually. No Korean. No Korean. No Korean. Um, and then you know the history they learn about Korean War were totally different from what I learned in, in, in the elementary school and middle school. So first of all, Chinese students think that we invaded North North. Yeah, right. So from there, we had this huge gap. So I try not to think talk about anything historical or anything political. But then one student, so for the site analysis, one student came up with really interesting research. So. Uh, the, the volunteer army, the Chinese volunteer army at the time, um, when they invade south, so when they enter Pen Korean Peninsula, they only, so like near Charon, when they were uh, ordered to uh, go into further, to, the two, to actually get Seoul, they only were given two weeks of meals, the food. So that they, they need to get to Seoul for one week and then get Seoul, and then come back to Charon area. So only two weeks were two weeks of food were given. So what he did was he he kind of calculated how much how what is the distance that he, people can walk for 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 two weeks, and then he analyzed the hinterland with that distance. So it was really interesting research. So that's something that I never really even knew about, I didn't want to know about, and then I didn't even think about. So I think the opportunity really came from there. So if I if I had bias about anything like communism or anything, maybe I wasn't able to um, find those kind of opportunity. And I think you can also do that. I mean, you don't really have to. Even if someone lived there in, in China, India, border condition, they maybe don't, don't have any idea about the area. And I think also after I live in Netherlands, America for 10 years and when I came back, because of that uh, gap, uh, that made me really think and really look at my own country in a different way. And I think the Gangnam alternative nature was possible because of that, that period. Like, because you know, Dutch people are really uh, pragmatic people, really practical yeah. people, right? Yeah. They're kind of world most practical people, the Dutch people. And, and then, Yeah, and it's cynical. And then Korea, we usually very uh, value the Daemyeongbun, right? So I think we, and, I, and I, that's why I found Dutch culture really interesting. Mm. So uh, this place has to close at nine. If, is there any last question? This will be the last question, but you still can send some email questions. Would it be okay if we share your email with the students? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, 
그러니까 그 한강이 다 그렇게 콘크리트 제방으로 변한 것과 하천들이 복개된 것과 다 보면 일맥상통한 이유가 뭐냐면 이제 서울이 도시화가 되면서 옛날에는 비가 많이 오면 이제 하천이 넘치고 좀 이렇게 하수구도 약간 올라왔다가 내려가고 이게 이제 그냥 같이 살았잖아요 그러고 그 서울이 이제 말하자면 마더니지션 되면서 그게 되게 리스크가 된 거죠 도시에 되게 위생 문제도 일어나고 경제적인 손해도 생기면서 그래서 이제 그런 하천들은 되게 거대한 하수구로 바뀌게 된 거죠 드레니지 웨이로 바뀌고 한강도 이제 서울이 디벨롭 되면서 더 이상 그 여, 여름에 홍수라는 리스크를 감당할 수 없으니까 완전히 오버리 시브 엔지니어 된 콘크리트 타이크로 바뀐 거고 근데 지금 이제 제가 계속 클라이밋 체인지 얘기를 하는 이유가 예전에는 200년 단위 홍수 이런 거로 이제 엔지니어 했다면 지금 비가 얼마큼 올지 아무도 예측을 못 하는 거예요 어떨 땐 너무 심한 가뭄이고 어떨 땐막 500년에 한 번씩 올 만한 홍수가 생기고 근데 이거를 언제까지 그리고 굉장히 집중, 집중호가 많이 내리잖아요 그러니까 이거 언제까지 그 드라니쉬 파이프를 늘리는 거로는 감당이 안 되는 거거든요 근데 결국은 다시 저는 모든 하천이 다 이렇게 그 범람원으로 바뀌어야 된다고 생각해요 그 지금 탄천이 100m예요 폭이 근데 평소에는 수심이 1m 정도밖에 안 되는데 홍수위가 17m가 그렇거든요 그러니까 물이 모이면 그렇게까지 확 몰렸다가 이제 그거를 대비해서 이제 폭을 어마하게 어마어마하게 해놓는데 작년에 탄천할 때 제가 그 수리학자랑 한테 물어보니까 계산해 보면 38m 폭만 있으면 된대요. 38m 폭만 되고 이걸 슬로브로만 올려도 충분히 오히려 이컬러스컬 하기 좋, 좋다는 거예요. 근데 이제 우리나라는 무조건 넓이 넓이 잡으면 좋다고 생각하는데 그렇게 되면 오히려 하천 생태계가 안 좋아지는 게그 안에서 이제 그 샌드하고 흙들이 지맘대로 이렇게 왔다 갔다 하면서 계속 쌓, 여기 여기 쌓이는 거예요. 그래서 썩고 막 이런 문제. 그래서 계속 그 드레징을 해줘야 되는. 그러니까 이제는 그런 엔지니어링 마인드에서 탈피를 해서 굉장히 그 미니멈의 옵티멈 사이즈로 다 하천을 좁게 만들고 그럼 유속도 빨라지고 훨씬. 네, 그런 그러니까 굉장히 이제 도시 하천이 바뀌어야 되는 거죠. 근데 이제 어 아까도 이제 두어 질문했지만 이걸 제가 시장님이 아닌 이상 <웃음> 언젠가 제가 빨리 컴퓨터는 이겨야 되는데 MBA들을 자꾸 이겨가지고. <웃음> 화가 나고 있죠. They just have to have better jewelry. Yeah. <웃음> 네. 와, 오늘 질문 그... 너무 감사해요. 많이 되게 good questions and very good discussion. I really appreciate. 오늘 너무 감사드리고 오늘 그 시간이 다 됐지만 이메일로 혹시 또그 you can send email if you have more questions. I have some name card if you want. Yes, so she has name card. But yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.